Hey guys, welcome back to Pop em Up Chem. In this video, we're going to carry on with Unit 4 and we're going to look at the concept of resonance and delocalization and how they affect our covalent structures. And for the HL students, we'll also look at formal charge. Firstly, though, here's a question just to get started drawing the shape and label the bond angles for PCL5. Take a moment and have a go at that. Okay, so hopefully you got that it's the five CLs connected with a single bond to the central phosphorus atom and then filling in all the lone pairs. Now, when we have five electron domains, of course, we're going to have the trigonal bipyramidal shape, which has an angle of 20 around the equatorial bonds and a angle of 90 between the axial and the equatorial. So what is resonance? Well, whenever there is more than one way to draw a Lewis structure, there are multiple possibilities and resonance posits that all of these possibilities may in some way be true and the molecule oscillates backwards and forwards between them at an incredibly high rate but still oscillates between these reasonable structures. So let's demonstrate this using SO2. Now if we draw the structure of SO2 we know that we're going to have a single bond on one side and a double bond on the other side bonded to the oxygens. So we don't know which bond should be a single and which bond should be a double bond. In fact, both of these molecules are reasonable Lewis structures. However, because they have different bond lengths and strengths, we have to say that they would be switching backwards and forwards between each other. What this allows us to do is it allows us to explain why some molecular shapes and bond lengths do not actually conform to classical ideas about bonding. And this is going to actually lead us on to our understanding of delocalization. Before that, though, let's have a look at a couple of key structures which feature a lot in the IB. So the first is the carboxylate ion. Now here, R is representing any hydrocarbon chain, carbon and hydrogens, because we're just focusing on the C double bond O and the single bond O minus group. Now you may have already recognized the similarity between the previous molecule where it's obviously difficult for us to say that this carbon oxygen bond would be the single bond and this would be the double bond. So we can say that these are resonance structures and that indeed they flip back and forth between each other. We see a similar situation with benzene, which is a cyclic compound. That means it joins up to itself and it's C6H6. We can draw this with an alternate single and double bonds. However, once again, it doesn't make sense for us to determine which one is single and which one is double. So it's better for us to characterize it as flipping between these two molecules. Sometimes this is drawn in what's called the skeletal structure, which simplifies our drawing of it. And we can just use a hexagon with the three lines on the inside. Okay, so time for you to have a go at a question. So the first question is try and draw the two resonance structures that you would expect to find for ozone. That's O3. Pause the video to have a go at that. Pop them up. Okay, so when we're drawing ozone, we can see that there's going to need to be a single and double bond drawing our Lewis structure. However, we don't know which one should be single and which one should be double. So we can see that these two forms are the resonance structures. Okay, next question. Try the same thing with the carbonate ion. That's CO32 minus. Remember to draw the Lewis structure first and then your resonance structures from there. Pause the video to have a go. Pop them up. Okay, so for the Lewis structure of the carbonate ion, we have the carbon in the center with the three oxygens, two single bonds and one double bond. The two singly bonded oxygens have a negative charge, giving the overall ion a two negative charge. 
And basically we can see that there is a three-way symmetry in this molecule. So we can switch the double bond for any of the previously single bonds, giving the carbonate ion three resonance structures. So of course, this can be pretty annoying to draw and actually potentially not even based in the real world. So delocalization is a concept that, that aims to marry these different Lewis structures and explain a little bit more about what's going on in the molecule. And fundamentally, this is based around a simple concept, which is when a molecule has electrons present in the molecule that are not attached to any specific atom, just like in the diagram I've drawn of graphite. So if we've conceptualized resonance as these molecules that flip backwards and forwards extremely quickly between one another, we can kind of build on that concept and think of delocalization as characterizing those structures instead of flipping backwards and forwards between each other as a composite of all of the different types, which gives us a kind of average structure. Now, to demonstrate what this looks like, we can use benzene. So benzene, we have the ring structure where we have alternate single and double bonds in that cyclic configuration. And we know that we can have two different resonance structures. However, if we replace the alternate single double bond with a kind of dotted line around, that kind of shows that we're acknowledging that we no, it doesn't actually switch between these two forms, that instead those electrons are spread all over the six different carbons. We can also use benzene to highlight the effects of delocalization. So delocalization stabilizes molecules and ions, and it does this by spreading out negative charge. And that's much more stable than just positioning it between two nuclei and this has an associated energy, which is the delocalization stabilization energy. This means that these molecules and ions are more stable than we might expect if we were to just look at single double bonds and the energy that was contained in those bonds. Indeed, this is exactly how polyatomic ions are able to stay stable. We can further illustrate this actually using values for benzene. So if we think of the bond lengths that we would expect if we had alternate single and double bonds, the carbon single and double bond lengths being 135 picometers and 147 picometers respectively. However, when we measure this with X-ray crystallography, we find that these are not actually the bond lengths. In fact, we find they are all equal and they have bond lengths of 140 picometers, indicating that the electrons are spread evenly. And so instead of having single and double bonds, we have something more like one and a half bonds all the way around the molecule. And this makes benzene very stable. Indeed, it doesn't just make benzene stable. We see the same effect happen with ozone. So ozone, which is O3, absorbs UV in the upper atmosphere. Oxygen or O2 has an associated wavelength of 241 nanometers. And the oxygen-oxygen bond in hydrogen peroxide, the single bond has an associated wavelength of 845 nanometers. However, when we look at ozone, because ozone has this resonance structure, we end up with this associated wavelength of about 330 nanometers, which is perfect for absorbing UV radiation. And that allows the process to occur in the upper atmosphere where UV light catalyzes the reaction of the breakdown of O3 into O2 and vice versa. It's a reversible reaction. All of this points to evidence that we don't actually have flipping resonance structures occurring in the real world. However, they're still very useful tools for us to use to draw out molecules, especially when we're doing organic chemistry to understand how molecules react with each other. However, delocalization offers a better description of what is going on 
with molecules in the real world. It is also congruent with the evidence of the stability of these molecules and the energy of the bonds that we associate with delocalization. So now I'm going to look at a HL only component, which is calculating formal charges. And really what formal charges are here to do is to help us actually quantify if the Lewis structure that we have drawn is more or less likely than another Lewis structure that may equally be drawn for a given molecule. It has a very simple formula where we take the number of valence electrons for a given atom, we subtract half of the bonding electrons, and then we subtract the number of bonding electrons, and that gives us the formal charge. So if we look at hydrogen in this very simple example and calculate the formal charge, we know that we have one valence electron in hydrogen and it's got one bonding pair. So this will be one minus half of two minus zero as there's no other lone pairs. So we end up with a formal charge of zero. In the case of chlorine, we have seven valence electrons and the same number of bonding electrons, two, because there's only one bond. So we get half of two again and we have six non-bonding electrons, three lone pairs. So seven minus one minus six is equal to zero. So both atoms in this instance have a formal charge of zero. So before you have a couple of goes yourself, let's have a look at water. So doing hydrogen again, which is both of the hydrogens are in the same condition here. So it's going to be once again, one minus half of two minus zero, which equals to zero. And looking at oxygen, we of course have six valence electrons minus, and there's two bonds here, so half of four minus four for the two lone pairs also equals to zero. Before we move on how to use this to determine which structure would be correct, let's have a go at a question. First question, calculate the formal charges for the atoms in pH3. Pause the video to have a go at that. Pop them up. So phosphorus first. Phosphorus is in group five, so it has five electrons in the outer shell and here has three single bonds. So five minus half of six minus two is zero. And hydrogen, you may be getting a theme about hydrogen, is one minus half of two minus zero which also equals zero. So both of the atoms in this case have a formal charge of zero. Try the same thing, although I haven't given you the Lewis structure of this one, for the ammonium ion, NH4+. Pause the video to have a go at that. Pop them up. So once we've drawn the Lewis structure, we see that we have the nitrogen single bonded to four different hydrogens, all of these hydrogens can have the same formal charge. That's going to be one minus half of two minus zero, which once again is zero. The formal charge of nitrogen is going to be five, because it's in group five, minus half of eight minus zero, which is plus one. And that makes sense because we have an overall charge of plus one on this ion. Indeed. So the formal charge is really useful when it comes to determining which of potential octet violating compounds is more likely. And we can use the example here of sulfur dioxide, one on the left that obeys the octet rule and one that has an expanded octet to really evidence why sulfur forms this expanded octet. If we first look at the formal charge of the first oxygen on the left of the molecule on the left hand side, we end up with a formal charge of minus one. And the second oxygen on the right hand side of the same molecule, we find has a formal charge of zero. The sulfur in the middle, once we've done that, sulfur obviously in group six also has a formal charge of plus one. Now, when we look at the one with the expanded octet, we can do the formal charge of the oxygen, which is the same in both situations here. So we get six minus half times four minus four, which equals zero. So there's no formal charge on either of the oxygens. And if we look, we calculate the formal charge for sulfur in the situation with this expanded octet, 
and we see it also has a formal charge of zero. So sulfur with an expanded octet is more stable than sulfur with the octet. We can actually quantify this further by taking the same molecules and using this equation, taking the maximum formal charge and minusing the minimum formal charge. Whichever compound gives a delta Fc that is closest to zero is going to be more likely. So let's calculate that for both of these molecules. The molecule on the left First then, we see its maximum formal charge is of course plus one, and its minimum formal charge is minus one, which gives us a delta Fc of plus two. The molecule on the right hand side, we see the maximum is zero and the minimum is zero, so we already know that we're going to have a delta Fc of zero, showing us quantitatively that the sulfur dioxide with the expanded octet is more stable. So let's further illustrate this by looking at the example of sulfur trioxide. So we've got the two different alternative Lewis structures here and one on the right expanded octet, one on the left not. So going through all of the formal charges on the left we get plus two for our sulfur in the middle and our two oxygens that are single bonded at the top we're going to get a formal charge of negative one and the oxygen at the bottom, we're going to get a formal charge of zero. So then we can calculate our delta Fc by taking our maximum, which is plus two and subtracting our minimum, which is minus one. And so we're going to get plus three for our delta Fc on this version of the compound. Now, if we do the same, calculating our formal charges of the sulfur on the molecule on the right hand side, we get a formal charge of zero once again. If we calculate the formal charge on the oxygen, which are all the same in this molecule, we get zero once again. And of course, maximum and minimum zero minus zero is of course zero. So the delta formal charge on the molecule on the right is zero. And so that is going to be our preferred structure. So let's do a couple of questions practice here just to wrap up the video. First question, calculate the overall or delta Fc for the molecule IF4+. Pause the video and have a go. Pop them up. So the good thing about this molecule is all of the fluorines are in the same condition. So we do seven minus half of two minus six, which is zero. And the iodine has seven minus half of eight minus two, because it has a lone pair, which is plus one. So our overall delta Fc is plus one minus zero, which of course is plus one. Okay, one last question. Calculate which of the two resonance structures for azine is preferred. Pause the video to have a go at that. Pop them up. So with these compounds, I'm just going to clearly mark each of the nitrogens and jump in. So nitrogen A, we find has a formal charge of zero. Nitrogen B, we find has a formal charge of plus one. And nitrogen C, we find has a formal charge of minus two. So for delta FC, we find plus one minus minus two, which is plus three. Doing the same again but in green with the molecule on the right, we find Na is formal charge of minus one. Nb is a formal charge of plus one. And I've calculated the last one, even though it's unnecessary as it's the same as A giving us a formal charge of minus one. So here, maximum minus minimum, we end up with plus two. So the one closer to zero is of course going to be the preferred structure, which is the structure drawn on the right. Okay guys, no practical for this lesson, but plenty of questions whether you're SL or HL. 
Thanks again for joining me, guys. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon. As always, practice makes slightly better.